Um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Rahul. I work for a company called PayPal. Uh, we are in the payment space, um, headquartered in San Jose, California, which is where I work as well. Uh, great API products don't get built by mistake. There's a lot of effort, a lot of due diligence, and a lot, a lot of time that goes into actually making great API products. For the last few years, I sort of exclusively focused on building products where the pre-persona is the developer. And what I'm going to share before you today is some of the mistakes that I have made, some of the mistakes I've seen our competitors make, um, people I know have made, uh, and you know all the conversations that I've had in API conferences where I've heard others share their stories. Um, so this is my attempt to pass on the learnings to you uh, in the effort that when you sort of build your own API products, you don't sort of go through the same learning experience, but learn uh, from others, suggest so me. So if you've been in the API conference space or you've been sort of following the conversation for the last few years, uh, it's sort of revolved around a key things like you know being API first, thinking of APIs as products, thinking of developers as your customers, uh, design first was as code first, thinking of API governance, thinking of KPIs. Uh, I'm not going to cover these today. Uh, there's a lot of uh, information already available, and I hope that by now, a lot of the companies have sort of adopted this. Uh, where the angle that I'm coming from is what I feel over the course of years is, even if you actually do all of the above, you might still end up with a developer product or an API product which is not that developer friendly. And so I'm trying to focus my conversations around you know, how do you actually build to make products that are very usable, as well that developers love to appreciate it. So by now, I think a lot of companies have sort of matured to a point where they think of developers as your customers. A few years ago, that was clearly not the case. Uh, developers were not thought of as customers at all. Uh, but uh, you know, then the sort of conversation progressed to, well, who are these developers? And a lot of people started thinking, well, the developers are nobody different than the developers in my own development team. But over time, people realized nothing could be further than the truth. You know, the developers that work within your company probably know ins and outs of everything that you do. Uh, it's definitely not the case of an external developer. Um, you know, as an API product owner, it really pains me. Uh, but developers don't woke up, wake up every morning thinking that, hey, you know, I'm going to use this great API. Developers just love to build stuff. And API is just an annoyance they're trying to get after so that they can actually focus on what they'd like to do most. So at PayPal, uh, we are all about simplifying payments. Um, if you think about who would integrate uh, or use PayPal to integrate on a merchant site, uh, at one hand, we have someone who might be just out of college, um, you know, trying to make ends meet. He might be working as a freelancer, being paid $15, $20 an hour. Uh, in the middle, we have someone who's been in the payment space for the last 10 years and probably has a use for every single field in my API. So she is the sort of person I would love to work with because she is the one who I think I have already designed a product for. At the far end, uh, you know, we have like a high growth startup in the Bay Area. They're focusing on machine learning. They've realized they now need to make some money, so they pick their best developer and put him to integrate on payments but he or she has absolutely no interest in it because they'd rather just go back and work on the machine learning product they're building. So when you think about these from this perspective, uh, you know, different use cases and different ways on how you would build an API start to emerge. For someone on the left who is making $15, $20 an hour, they're going to bid on a project that's going to pay them $200 tops and think of the time and effort they're going to spend on it. The person in the middle, is probably going to be very heavily invested and probably work three months to integrate with your API. So knowing who this uh, key archetype users are will really help you evolve your API to a point where you really get to an understanding uh, and sort of design your APIs in that particular fashion. Uh, the second thing <coughs> that I comes to mind is, uh, you know, it's an API conference, a platform conference, we love to talk about APIs, but APIs are the starting point. They are not the end in itself. Uh, APIs really enable partners and merchants and other people to integrate with you. But maybe at start, all they need is a widget that they would want to put on their website powered by your API. 
maybe six months down the line is when they would really want to use a repair to do something custom. Uh, you might have someone who's uh, integrated with another API and now wants to migrate to your API because you're offering them something better. Now, when you think about what that integration experience is, you know, you then start to realize what are you really actually building for. So one of the things I would highly encourage you guys as you think about your API products is almost do sort of a one sort of a one pager where you sort of write the input outputs and all the integration patterns that you expect your API to be used. Because knowing the context in which your API gets used is going to be super critical for your success. Uh, if building an API is literally the first step in that process. Thinking about how a developer would approach it, how would you sell it, uh, how would it get used, is what will differentiate your API products from something else in the marketplace. Uh, once you name an API, uh, it stays there for a pretty long time. Uh, you might have a great versioning strategy, you might evolve very quickly, but the people integrated with you might not evolve. And so something uh, you know, sticks for a really, really long time. Uh, as parent, um, you know, I had to go through this exercise of naming my kids four years ago when they were born. I'm originally from India, uh, but now I'm an American citizen, so I'm going to be living there for a long time. So one of the first criteria for me as a parent was, well, who's the audience, right? So the audience is going to be people back in India or people back in America. Now, if you're naming a child, what was very important to me was, hey, is the first name and last name going to rhyme? You don't want to seem across that the first name was put together by someone completely different than the surname. Uh, what is the probability that they would get teased? You know, Indian names in America are not the most common. So I wanted to make sure that they don't get teased, or at least the probability of getting teased was very, very low. It is someone similar to someone else in my family. You know, we have big families, you don't get to get mixed up with two people having the same name. Is it trending? Is it common? You know, is it something that my kid is going to look back and say, why did you give me that name? Um, is it clear that is it a boy or a girl? Uh, does it have any alternate meanings or pronunciations? So as parents, we obsess about names. You know, I've had people who think about names the moment they know they're going to have a child. Now, in my case, I had twins. So even though I picked the two names, now the, it was harder to now say which, who wants, which girl gets which name. But I'm going to stop the story right there. Uh, but the point I'm trying to make is things like what are the fields do you use in your APIs? You know, a lot of common mistakes are, it's something that you have in your database. Uh, you use one convention in one API and something completely different in another. What's the probability of it getting misspelled? Uh, you know, think about that person from Ukraine, uh, fresh out of college, English is probably second or third language, you know, what's the probability of him really getting preferred with two R's rather than two F's? You know, these things are, uh, you know, it doesn't sound like much, but when you actually add up, it does make for a usable and unusable API. What English are you going to use? Um, are things redundant? Like things like gross total amount. Why do you need all those words? You know, total amount or gross amount pretty much say the same thing. Uh, does it do what it says? Uh, so we had an API where we called it a field called invoice number, but it would take an alphanumeric. Someone reading it now has to make a mental understanding, okay, I can pass in INV1234 instead of just passing numbers. Uh, things that are unnecessarily abridged. You know, we don't live in the world of mainframes. We can type in account number instead of ACCT number. And arcane names. You know, we, I love in work in payments. Uh, if you think about the person in the middle who's worked in payments for 10 years, she would get something called PAN. But PAN is nothing than the number that you see on your card. Is it not much better to just call it a card number? Uh, the person that I talked about, the guy in Ukraine or the guy in the startup, is going to more resonate with what a card number is than what a PAN is. So I think as you think about your APIs, think about the terminology that you use. You know, you might start out with focusing on a user who loves your domain, who understands everything there is to be about it. But developers graduate all the time. They might not know everything about the airline industry or the retail industry. So something that's common and more understandable is going to make your APIs a lot more usable and the learning curve will be a lot lower. 
So this is a typical product process that we go through, and I've seen it in not just at PayPal, but many other companies that I work with. It typically starts with a discovery phase where you sort of lay out the problem, you think about who your competitors are, what is, you know, you think about what the personas are, with the whole point of coming up with a set of epics that sort of define what you want to do. You then sort of take it to the next level uh, and think about design. And in the API world, it's a lot about, okay, what are your endpoints going to look like? What are your fields going to look like? Uh, what security model do we have? Uh, do we have mocks in place so that we can try out earlier in the design phase whether your API is something that people like or resonate with uh, to a point where you sort of have a specification and you have a list of user stories that the development team can consume. From then on, you, meant you sort of move to the develop phase where it's all about coming up with that prioritized set of backlog and going through um, thinking about changing from spec to code, doing the documentation, to get to a product which is sort of an MVP. And then you move on to a final product which is deploy and launch. Uh, we sort of put things together on sandbox, make it available and better. Uh, so this process is great. You know, I think a lot of companies probably have this process. But I, I got into a discussion with one of my leadership teams and say, Rahul, I just need to add a field in the database or a field in my API. Why is it going to take you a month? Now, it shouldn't take a month, and normally it doesn't take a month, but the reality is, as an API designer, as an API product owner, I'm building something that is needed today, but I have to think five, six years into the future. So a field in an API is not just something I need. I need to put it in today, but I think I need to think about how it's going to evolve over the next five or six years. So I can quickly whiz through this process very, very quickly, but you're going to get a suboptimal product. So I think the issue really isn't about how much time, uh, or rather uh, the process itself, but really how much time and due diligence do you actually go through it. Skipping the process or not doing your research or not going through uh, really that exercise of, okay, who your developer is, how are he or she going to comprehend uh, the field, what name should we give it? If you don't really think of this, and just call it something and just put it in the API and get it launched the fastest way possible, you're not going to come up with a usability. Right? So I think it's very crucial that you actually spend time and due diligence in actually going through this process or any other process that you have, keeping into mind that what you do today is something that's going to live for a very long time. Uh, the other point that I wanted to make was uh, we tend to focus on API as a product construct. I know it's very hard. I've been through that process where uh, you know, you're know, you up against a corporate where this, there's no culture of APIs. You're starting afresh, and getting an API out is a challenge in itself. Uh, but the reality is API is just a start. right? You can't forget the whole NTR ecosystem. Uh, you know, An API without an SDK, well, it's possible, but is it really the best experience for a developer? Uh, is a sandbox that's only available 80% of the time really that great? What experience, what does it tell about what your production system would be? Uh, you know, if you have a, a professional services organization or tech support, do they even have the debugging tools so that they can help your customer? I mean, how embarrassing it is for you to get a complaint and then having to ask for what the request was to your customer, right? So the little things do matter. And it does take a really, really long time to put this infrastructure in place. So as you're building about your API products, think about the entire ecosystem, because the ecosystem is sort of what's going to get your product being very usable. Uh, you know, If you have some sort of a documentation, but you never revive it, never look to see if it's really something which your developer understands, then you're going to be left with a box that sticks that's saying, OK, I built an API product. It has documentation. Uh, and um, you must have spent six months on the API design, but zero effort on the documentation is going to fail. So I think thinking about the whole API ecosystem is what really is going to drive the success of your product. Uh, API organization is sort of a hot topic. There are multiple companies. They sort of tend to approach in very different ways. Uh, I'm sure you've heard about the Conway's Law, which basically says that and how your organization is structured will sort of dictate the software systems you produce. Uh, and what I've seen is it also sort of dictates by its very nature the sort of API products that you bring to market. 
So let's look at a very simple, typical way in which most companies organize their products. Uh, they have API consumers, they might be consuming one or more of their APIs. Uh, you have a governance system in place to make sure everyone is following some sort of a logical order, some sort of a standard. And then each of the API products have their own director or vice president, and they have their own teams. Now, what this is going to end up uh, is really, it's, it's a factor of how much governance do you have and how much resting they have in each of these products, how much time and effort do they put into it. Because what's going to end up happening inevitably is no matter how much effort and time you put in, there are going to be little nuances that come in between each of these APIs, which makes the consumer who's sort of integrating with one or more of them uh, very, very difficult to integrate. Because once they finish integrating with the API 1, they now have to deal with some of the nuances or some of the different naming conventions that API 2 has followed. Now, your API governance can try its best uh, to make sure everything is aligned. But I will leave you to decide whether your company's governance structure is doing a good job or not. Now, what I've worked, and this is just me cheating a little bit, is if you know you're always going to sell two products in the marketplace, having a team that sort of is responsible for everything that's responsible from a developer interface perspective, I think makes for a better organization structure. Because you don't have competing directors to work with. You have one API team that's making sure that you, when it's selling a solution, you always need these two APIs. You're coming to market with something that's consistent, right? And there's no sort of a culture shock moving from one API to another. Uh, so I think think about your organization. Think about how uh, you, where, where does the API sit. See if this is your problem. This might be a way to get around just relying on governance alone. So in summary, uh, what I would encourage you to think about is you know, focus on your developer. I know it's hard. You, know, you say, OK, do I need a budget to go out and find out who my developers are? Not really. Uh, you could hop on a sales call, just be friends with your professional services organization, do a little bit of customer support. There's always ways to know who your developers are and try to build a mental model of them and use that in your day-to-day -day conversation. You know, think about the end-to-end -end experience. Uh, you know, we are as ourselves passionate about APIs, but not everyone necessarily is. What they're trying to do is make an integration happen. You know, they're not going to just integrate for the sake of loving your product. It might be the most best well-designed API in the world, but if all they need is a widget, that's what they're going to use. Uh, be obsessive about naming. You know, it's very hard to change names, uh, even if you don't like them. Right? Because once you're integrated, there's a high cost to move things over, high cost of maintaining things over. Uh, so be obsessive about it, take the time to do it. And, and so, you know, just, just focus, right? I mean, it takes a certain amount of time uh, to build a product, go through the process, don't skip a step. I, I appreciate I've been in situations where it's really, really hard to do it, uh, but you need to make the effort, you need to set the bar. You know, if you're just going to let things slow, then, you know, don't blame that your API product don't be as good as everyone else out there. Um, and also focus across the APS ecosystem, right? Uh, I know it can be a bit tiring, you know, you sort of launch your API product, you want to celebrate, but until you have the ecosystem in place, the adoption is just not going to happen. And think about the API design. You know, I've met engineers, we sort of work in big organizations, small organizations, Nobody wakes up trying to build a bad API. That's nobody's intention. But you know, maybe the boss you report into or the organization structure does influence what you get to market. And so it's really important to keep that perspective in mind as you think about building your API product. Uh, I love this thing. You know, I speak at conferences all the time. Uh, you know, let's keep the conversation going. Uh, find me. I'll be around for both of the days. Uh, tweet about it, but I would love to hear what problems you have, and hopefully I sort of inspired you to think about your API products a bit differently. Um, and thank you so much. Take care.